Well, hello, everybody. I hope this recording <clears throat> works okay. I'm up in Oregon right now. Didi and I came up for something kind of kind of precious. Uh, two of our dearest friends, they, their granddaughter uh, passed away, 12 years old. She had a disease, just a beautiful young lady. And so we, we just kind of came up to, to be here and to love on them and to support them. So we're, we're up here and I'm staying at a friend's house. And so I'm recording from her office and I'm not crazy about the lighting. There's two lights back here, it's like UFOs, but um, it's just got to make do. So uh, I tried to turn them off, but then I'm so dark, you know, what I lay. Okay. So we are continuing our study today in the gospel according to Luke. And uh, this is an exciting time because Jesus now is about to end his, his 30 years of anonymity. And he's about to hit the stage of the world. His ministry is about to launch. And the way it launches is we talked about it last week. He came down to Judea in the south to where John was baptizing. And he is baptized by John comes up out of the water and the heavens open and a voice says this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased and the Holy Spirit descended in the form of a dove and rested on it and so now he comes out of that place and something very very interesting takes place and that's what we're going to talk about today you know it's a uh, Super Bowl week starting to Tomorrow is the last week before the Super Bowl. It's going to be a great Super Bowl. Where we crown at the end of that game, the el campeón, the champion of American football. And we know it's temporary because next year is going to be another champion. Uh, but, you know, when it comes to champions, there's one champion that is like no other. For the Christ follower, uh, Jesus is the ultimate champion he is our lord he's our master he's our savior he's our friend and ain't nobody like jesus there never has been never will be uh, jesus stands alone as our lord he's the only begotten son of god and everything in heaven and on earth has been placed under his feet ephesians 1 18 listen to the pauls I pray that also the eyes of your heart might be enlightened in order that you might know the hope that uh, he has called you to, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints and his incomparably great power for us who believe. The power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realm, far above all rule, power, dominion, and, he, and every title I be given not only in the present age, but in the age to come. Listen to verse 22. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. So I say, I, I read this scripture so we can get an accurate picture. Jesus is the head of everything. Everything in all creation has been placed under his feet. And we those who believe in him are being conformed to his image. That, that's what God's doing in our 70 years or whatever we have on our 12 years, 50 years. We are being conformed to the image of Christ. Now, the path to this transformation is walking by faith, but how he shapes us is as we learn obedience. Obedience to the will of the Father, fulfilling all righteousness. That's what Jesus did. It says God became a man, and that man lived as a human completely and totally submitted to God. Jesus, every breath was yielded to the Father. He never sinned. And then he was empowered by the Holy Spirit, the exact same Holy Spirit that empowered us. But he walked in our shoes so that he knows perfectly what we go through. Now, here's an important thing. It was true for Jesus and it's true for us. 
in regard to this journey of faith that we're on, every decision to obey God that we make will be tested. Just as in life, every decision for change is tested. So every decision that we make to be conformed to the image of Christ, so maybe before we're on this journey, we're selfish and we only think about ourselves. And then we come to know Christ and he begins to change us and we stop thinking about ourselves all the time and we actually begin to think about others. We stop gathering everything for ourselves. We stop looking for the biggest piece of pie to come to our way. And instead, we give the biggest piece of pie to somebody else. That is a transformation as we are becoming more like Christ. Well, every decision we make in the path of transformation will be tested. That's just the nature of it. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm right now, I'm trying to get in tip-top shape uh, by the last week of April uh, because we're going to Israel. And uh, also, I'm challenged by Ron Rivera and his boot camp. I right? look at that stuff. So right now, I'm lifting three days a week. I'm riding a spin bike, trying to lose about 30 pounds. And uh, I'm, I have to make these decisions every day afresh. Every day, I have to decide to go to the YMCA. And every day, it's tested. Am I going to get up and I'm going to go work out? Am I going to eat smart or I'm going to eat foolishly? What am I going to do? And so as you make these decisions and they're tested, the more you make your decisions of change part of your lifestyle, it becomes easier and easier to walk that way. It becomes easier and easier to work out if you work out three times a week and never miss. Then it just becomes, yeah, this is what I do. Whereas if you start missing that, oh man, I want to watch TV. I want to see this game, whatever. Well, in the spiritual realm, uh, the very first thing that happens to Jesus when he steps into his ministry, uh, this three-year public ministry that is going to culminate in the cross and the resurrection, immediately coming out of the water is as the Holy Spirit drove him or led him, I should say, into the wilderness where he was for 40 days being tempted by the devil. You see, God does not tempt us with evil. The devil does. God tests us. God tests us. And one of the parts of that process of testing is temptation, which is from the evil one. But only God allows the devil to test us, to tempt us, that we might be tested as if by fire and come out changed. Never forget this. The devil is God's devil. And he exists for a purpose. It's not like these two equals fighting it out. No, no, no. There's God. And then not even in the same breath is the devil. The devil would cease to exist at a thought from God. But if that were to happen, that would hijack God's process of creating a people for himself. For God to have a people that are committed to him and following him, there has to be a choice. If there's no choice, then there's no love. But love is a choice. To follow God is a choice. But to do that, there has to be something we're choosing from, choosing to. That's love. I mean, if you were to coerce people, put a gun to their head to some gal and say, hey, if you don't love me, I'm going to blow your head off. Uh, okay, I love you. That's not love. That's coercion. But when somebody chooses you, chooses to give their life to you, give themselves to you, spend their life with you, that's a choice. That's love. But in order to be love, there has to be a choice. In order for us to love God with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength, there has to be a choice. We have to exercise our free will to do that. That's what love is. If there were no options, how could that be love? It just would be. But for it to be a loving relationship, there has to be a choice. There has to be the existence of evil. And so we choose God. That's love. Now, <clears throat> for us to be prepared for eternity, there has to be a testing, a strengthening of all that we are. 
Would you ever want to get on an airplane that had never been tested? Man, when they build an airplane, they put stress on the wing, stress on the wing, stress on the wing until cracks show up and they know that's the weak part. And now they strengthen that and then stress on the wing, stress on the wing, stress on the, they test it so that it can be strengthened and it can work properly and it can be safe. Same thing with what God's doing in our lives. What every time he does, does anything in our life, it's tested so that it might be strengthened and confirmed and that we might know what is really happening here. We have chosen for him. So testing is a vital part of preparation for anything, a car, a building, a concrete, and especially our spiritual development. So Jesus, who was the firstborn of God, the first fruit is the trailblazer in fulfilling all righteousness. So he was baptized, though he didn't have sin, because he said, I must do this to fulfill all righteousness. When he was baptized in River Jordan. So then it says in J Luke chapter four, verse one, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the spirit into the desert, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days. And at the end of them, he was hungry. Now fasting. Fasting is a very powerful, powerful spiritual discipline. There are spiritual disciplines of, um, of action, like reading your Bible, praying, giving to the poor. Those are all spiritual disciplines that transform us as we practice them. Those are spiritual disciplines of commission. You do those things. And then there's spiritual disciplines of omission, where we take away things. Both spiritual disciplines. Spiritual discipline of omission would be the discipline of silence, uh, of solitude. You go without company. You go without sound. Quiet. And then fasting is to set aside something that feeds your earthly appetites for a season to prove that this is not what runs the show, the flesh, but the spirit runs the show. Fasting is how you strengthen the reality of your flesh serves the spirit, not, not the other way around. And so uh, your physical body serves the spirit. Um, so Jesus immediately is taken out into the wilderness. And I mentioned it last week. I've driven through this wilderness in a military Jeep. And it is a barrenness like I've never seen before in my life. And this is where Jesus spent 40 days. Now, when you fast, after about three or four or five days, hunger ceases, actually, believe it or not. And your body then turns fully on your fat stores and begins to consume the reserves of your body. So you're not really hungry during that middle part. But at about the 40-day mark, the body runs out of reserves and begins to consume healthy tissue, muscle tissue. And then hunger returns. And this is when actual starvation begins, when your body is consuming uh, healthy organs and so on. So the Bible says that for 40 days, Jesus is in the wilderness, doesn't eat anything, and he's fasting. And during this time, go with me in your imagination, if you will, to be with Jesus during this time. He's walking, probably in the heat of the day he tucks under some shade at night he sits out on a rock he's praying he's thinking he's about to launch into ministry he's going over the things that he has learned of god that is going to be the content of his teaching he's thinking through his strategy of how he's going to do this uh, 12 disciples invest in them train them <coughs> he's receiving wisdom from the father. The Bible says anybody lacks wisdom, let him ask the father. But Jesus didn't lack anything, but he's receiving wisdom from the father, his strategy. And he's also completely yielding to the spirit that descended on him in the Jordan River. This would be the dynamo that would operate through him whenever uh, Jesus would deliver from demonic. It was by the post. It would be by the spirit. When he would heal somebody by the spirit, the same way people are healed when you lay your hands on them, it's by the spirit. 
walk on water. They first record the case of barefoot water skiing. Jesus walking on the water. It's by the spirit. So in this wilderness time, 40 days, he is completely praying through every aspect of what's coming next. He's getting clear. Jesus wasn't like this confused, you know, oh, what do I do next? No, he says, what I hear the father saying, I say. What I see the father doing, I do. And all of this is being sharply focused in this 40 days of temptation and testing. Now, he gets clear and he's ready. And he is tempted by the devil. Everything that Jesus is, just like you and I, everything that we are, is going to be tested. And one of the ways that we're tested is by the temptations that come our way. I mean, it's, it's like this in life. You say, I'm going to cut sugar out of my diet. I'm going to eat clean, drink lots of water, eat clean, cut carbs down by 80%. I'm going to avoid sugar. And then you're out to dinner and, oh, man, here comes a big old thing of flan or cheesecake. You're just being tested. I was in the physical realm, you just go, hmm, no, I've made this decision. I think I'll pass or you, whatever you choose to. The son of God himself was not exempt from temptation because he was fully human. The difference, though, is that he doesn't succumb to temptation. We do. And Jesus faced more temptation than any mortal had ever faced before. I'll explain that in just a little while. He was tempted by the devil, but did not sin so that we can have a high priest then who completely understands what we're going through when we're struggling and he can offer us help at the moment of our temptation. We don't have a God who's oblivious to what it's like to be in this human body. We have a God that became a man and lived in this human body, faced temptations, did not sin, so that when we face temptations, we have a God, a high priest that can understand and that can give us help in our time of need. So he, there's a threefold temptation that Jesus experienced in the wilderness. First, he is tempted in the area of the role of the flesh. Does the flesh rule or does the spirit rule? See, the Holy Spirit led him into the wilderness to be tempted so now he's being led by the spirit so while he's there the devil says to him in four three of chapter luke the devil said to him if you are the son of god tell this stone to become bread in other words dude you're hungry you haven't eaten in 40 days by the way it's trippy man when you're in israel they sell these loaves of bread that are delicious. And then this little seasoning thing that you dip in is fantastic. We'll get some. There we go. These, they're like loaves of bread all over the place. They sell them. Middle Eastern kind of bread. In the wilderness, I couldn't believe it. It's covered with stones. And these stones look like loaves of bread. They look, they're the same shape of the loaves of bread that you buy in Jerusalem. And so can you imagine you're tired, you're hungry you haven't eaten in 40 days and you see these 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 stones everywhere and they look like loaves of bread and so you say my gosh so the devil jumps on it and says turn one of these stones to loaf of bread if you're really who you say you are feed your flesh your flesh is hungry but then jesus says jesus answered it is written man does not live by bread alone now listen watch this Every time Jesus is tempted, where does he go? To the word of God. He didn't say, devil, don't you know who I am? Don't you know that I was there and I saw you thrown from heaven? No, hey, what do you, who you mess? No, no. Mm -mm. He goes to the word. That's why we got to have the word in our life. If Jesus went to the word, where do we go? We got to go to the word. Because we face the same temptation. Does this flesh rule or does Jesus rule? For fallen men and women, as well as carnal Christians, people that have accepted Christ but are living with no evidence of it, this, the flesh rules. I want this. I, I, my flesh wants it, so I have it. Christians who are sold out to Jesus 
always ask this question first in any decision they make. What does the word of God say? That's the first question you ask. Hey, you want to do this, this, this? You want to do this? What does the word of God say? You want to handle this business deal this way? What does the word of God say? You want to treat this person who deserves it this way? What does the word of God say? What does the word of God teach? And when the word of God does not address something specifically, we're not like foolish little children and go, aha, I can get away with now because the Bible doesn't talk about this. No, no, no. What are the principles that we do understand from the word of God that guide us in this situation? So Jesus is tempted by the devil to, first of all, satisfy the desires of the flesh over what the Holy Spirit was leading him to do, which is prepare for this next three years of ministry. And so he says, no, uh, yeah, bread's great, but I don't need that right now because I've got, matter of fact, one time at, in, in the Gospel of John, when he's uh, at the woman, meets the woman at the well, and uh, his disciples come back and say, hey, uh, uh, are you hungry? And he goes, I've got bread you don't know of. In other words, he learned that, that physical food is fine, but it's not the end all. The end all is the presence of God and doing the will of the Father. So then Jesus passed. So then, second temptation, knowing who Jesus was and what he came to do. Okay, so Satan knows that the devil, Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. Jesus came to set things right. At the fall, the devil became like king of the earth in a sense you know i mean he ran every man woman boy and girl had fallen into sin jesus came to redeem fallen earth back to god redeem fallen man back to god so satan knows this so he says okay well that's what he's here i'm going to offer him a shortcut there's a way that he can have dominion over the world that would avoid the cross. I'm going to tempt him in this. Luke 4, 5. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all of the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor for it has been given to me and I can give it to anyone I want to. So if you worship me, it will be all yours. So Jesus at some point was go is going to every, all of earth was going to be put under his feet right we talked about that at the beginning today so the enemy says how about if you have everything given to you but by me and i'm not going to require you to go to the cross i'm not going to have you require you to obey the father all you got to do is worship me and it's yours so Luke 4, 8, oh, Jesus, our champion. Jesus answered, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Once again, can you see what he's doing? When the enemy tempted him, Jesus went to the word. When we're tempted, we need to go to the word. And if we don't have a promise to stand on, if we don't have a clear understanding of the word, that's why studies like this and the other studies that you have and your your local church, which should be your priority, uh, are so important. We're getting the word so that when we face temptation, we go to the word. But if we don't know the word, we don't have anything to go to. Your Bible is only as thick as what you know. Your Bible could be this thick, but if you don't know any of it, it might as well not exist. But your Bible is only a stick, is that which you know. And of course, Jesus knew the word because he was the word. So he says, okay, wait a second. So this shortcut you're offering me, you're saying that the only requirement is that I worship you? Right there, beep, 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 beep. Uh-uh, why? Because the word says, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. In other words, Jesus says to Satan, I will not take your shortcut for a lot of reasons. But here's the main reason I'm going to take your shortcut, devil. Because I will bow in worship before no one, but the only one who deserves worship, the only one who is worth, worthy of worship, and that is God. So to your offer, 
No gracias. Now, in our journey of being conformed to the image of Christ, we are bombarded by options of, of, uh, to worshiping God and him alone. Uh, put me first. Put this first. Put your business first. Put yourself first. Put your comfort first. Uh, put this team first. Put every, this, all this stuff first in your life. Our biggest struggle is to put ourselves first in place of God. Uh, I hate this person because he, this person deserves it and it feels good to hate him. When we take that stance, we are putting ourselves first. Uh, I'll do this even though I know it's not God's will or God's best for me, but I'll make that call. Thank you very much. See what we're doing? We're putting ourselves in the place of God. We're all tempted to do this, every one of us. But when you're walking in the spirit and you're following him, you then you like a draft, a race car that drafts behind another car. See, the cars don't want to lead during a race. They want to draft. They let this guy lead and then they draft in and the vacuum it's created here. They're able to follow that car, not use as much gas. And then at the right time, I don't know, win the race. Well, that's what we do. We draft. We just never get out and win the race. We let Jesus win the race. We draft behind Jesus. And in this situation, we see Jesus being tempted with a shortcut. So where does he go? Get away. Don't you know who I am? No, he goes to the word. So we draft behind Jesus and we build our life on the word. I will worship God alone and him only will I serve. Jesus led the way. We draft behind Jesus and we do the same thing. And then finally, okay. The enemy says, okay, if you're going to do this thing, then let's do it right. If, okay, Jesus, you're going you're gonna to have this ministry. You're going to do some cool stuff. Let me help you. Let me be your promoter. Let me be your agent. Let's do it through spectacle, through sensation. You don't need three years. You, you do what I'm asking you to do right now, and in one week, you'll be the man. Luke 4, 9. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. He says, if you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Look at this. The devil is using God's word. Twisting it. But the devil is using God's word. But Jesus again answers. How? From the word. Jesus answered. It says, do not put the Lord your God to the test. In other words, the enemy is saying, use this process to do your ministry, blow people's mind, be spectacular, go to the temple and just come down. The God, you say God's going to take care of you. You'll just float down. People will flock to you. They look at this worker. here. Whoa. Was that Jesus method? No. Jesus method was critical to the result. Here's what's his method. Choose 12 men and a group of women and other men that followed them as well. And then live with them, travel with them, spend the night by the fire teaching them, show them how you treat people, show them the power of the Holy Spirit in you. Invest three years in these disciples so that when it was time to ascend to heaven, there were 12 disciples, 12 apostles who could then train 12 more or however many more and who would then train 12 more and on and on so that the gospel would then go to the very ends of the earth this is the process that jesus implemented and this is how he accomplished so that two thousand years later we're being taught god's word we're following jesus why because jesus did it right he did it god's way he did it the way he was led by the spirit to do he invested in a small group of men and women by the way and they went and discipled others, who discipled others and who discipled others. So his command to us, he only told his church to do one thing primarily, make disciples of all nations. Oftentimes the last thing the church gets around to, but that's the number one thing we should be about. 
That's how the kingdom of God would be ushered in, not by some L.A. or some Las Vegas magic show where he jumps off the temple and floats to the ground. So he says, basically, no, Satan, I'll pass on your shortcuts. I'll pass on your scripture twisting and I'll pass on your deception. Don't miss the fact that the devil tried to twist scripture each time in tempting Jesus, which is still happening today. And it has happened for 2,000 years. Just because somebody comes along in the name of God and quotes a lot of the Bible and knows a lot of the Bible, that doesn't mean they're to be trusted. They got to be checked out. Origen, who was one of the early church fathers, lived in the 300s, 400s. Uh, over 1,600 years ago, he said this, the devil, like heretics, said Origen, is quick to quote scripture. Whenever you hear the quotation from scripture, be careful of trusting the speaker immediately. Consider the person, what sort of life he leads, what sort of opinions he holds, what sort of intention he has. Otherwise, he might pretend that he is holy and not be holy. David Koresh, the cult leader who was killed in Waco with a bunch of people, that big old botched raid by the ATF. I saw him interviewed before all of that took place. The guy had about the whole Bible memorized. He could just recite books of the Bible. He, he, had, he knew more Bible than I will ever know. He probably forgot more Bible than I will ever know. But just because a person has a lot of Bible, don't let that be the end of your testing of that situation. You got to look at their life. You got to look at the way they treat people. You got to look at whether that life is in accordance with God's word. Um, Here's another cool thing. Because Jesus was tempted in all ways, such as we are, he knows what we're going through. When you're tempted, don't hide from God or think that God is disgusted with you because you're being tempted. Like, I'm tempted to do this and I know it's wrong. Don't think that God is going, what up? Weakling you are to be tempted. No, it's just the opposite. When we're tempted because of Jesus, God has compassion for us and grace to help us in our time of need. I'll finish with this. You might think, yeah, but he doesn't know what it's like to be me. He doesn't know what it feels like to feel the temptation I feel. You are so wrong in that. Matter of fact, you have no idea of what he bore. You see, uh, it's like a weightlifter. I think I've given you this illustration before. Let's say a weightlifter was going to do some squats. Okay, let's say we were going to do squats. So you put a wheel, put a wheel. That's 45, 40, that's 90, uh, 45 pound bar. So it's 135 pounds. Boom, boom, no problem. Another wheel, another wheel. Okay, okay. Another wheel, another wheel. Now it's like, oh, yeah, you barely get down. You don't want to get parallel, but you go ahead and get parallel and you come up. Another wheel, another wheel, another way. There comes a point for all of us where we get to the point where we can't come back up and we succumb under the weight that is on our shoulders. Same thing with temptation. There is a place of temptation that we can't bear. That, that we, we can only feel so, we can only feel 222 pounds of temptation before we fall. That is the extent of our knowledge of temptation. Okay. Now, Jesus, he stands there. Boom, wheel, wheel, boom, wheel, wheel, boom, wheel, wheel, boom. A hundred wheels this way, a hundred wheels this way. No sin. He feels, he has felt the depth of temptation beyond anything we could ever feel because he never, he never felt. He felt the fullness of temptation that was on mankind and yet did not sin. And because he knows the depth of temptation at that level, he can help us in our time of need. See how wonderful Jesus is? Then it says in Luke chapter 4, verse 13, when the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. He'd be back. But each time he would lose. And he comes back at us. But the devil is going to lose. 
The same victorious Jesus can be victorious in us as we rest and live in him. So this, this little description of the temptation of Jesus, one, it gives us such a deeper appreciation for our Savior, but it also gives us tremendous resources to stand up under temptation because he is our deliverer. He is our trailblazer. He is the race car behind whom we draft. Okay? Okay. Well, thank you so much for listening in today. I hope this information was helpful. I hope it makes sense. Uh, let me know in the comments if you have questions or uh, additional thoughts. I'd love to hear them. And uh, thank you. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your financial support. Uh, several of you go on the canaproject.com and there's a button you can press to give and I appreciate that very, very much. So before I finish, can I pray a blessing over you? All right. This is a blessing that God told Moses to tell Aaron to pray over God's people whenever they came together. I think it's Numbers chapter six. He said, the Lord bless you and the Lord keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, I love you and I'll see you soon.